Hi, and welcome to Radonc Talks, a lecture series designed for students and residents of radiation oncology. My name is Rhea Mulherker. I'm currently a fourth-year resident in radiation oncology at the University of Pittsburgh, and I will be taking you through this introductory series on radiation oncology. In this first video, uh, we will talk about the clinical aspects of radiation oncology, but I encourage you to check out additional videos that we will be releasing on the basics of radiation biology and basics of radiation physics uh, to kind of hit the ground running in terms of an introduction to radiation oncology. For those of you who are new to radiation oncology, it is a field of medicine that uses radiation therapy to treat cancers as well as some benign conditions. We are called oncologists because we mainly specialize in treating all kinds of cancer from head to toe, but we do also use radiation therapy to treat some benign conditions, which we will be discussing later. In this particular lecture, my goals are to give you a basic overview of how cancer is treated, I'm talking about how we integrate different specialties and uh, our general approach to staging and cancer treatment. I'd like to talk about the different ways that radiation treatment is delivered, including internal and external uh, modalities, and finally give you some examples of when radiation is used and what our goals of treatment might be. On to our first objective then, let's talk about how cancer is treated uh, in very general terms. One thing that I certainly did not understand as a medical student is how interdisciplinary cancer care actually is. Um, as radiation oncologists, we work very closely with medical oncologists as well as surgical oncologists um, in order to come up with an appropriate treatment plan for our patients. Medical oncologists are the folks that prescribe systemic therapies. So this includes traditional cytotoxic chemotherapy that probably comes to mind when you think of cancer, as well as uh, immunotherapy agents, targeted therapy agents, and hormonal therapy. These drugs are typically given either orally or intravenously, um, and they are distributed throughout the bloodstream, so they have a systemic effect throughout the patient's body. Surgical oncologists, then, are responsible for local therapy, uh, local resection of the cancer, wherever it might be, um, and sometimes they can help us out by sampling lymph nodes in the area, so any lymph node regions that we're concerned the cancer might have spread to, um, and you know, even when uh, surgery is not able to be performed for curative purposes, sometimes the surgeons do get involved in palliative care. So if a patient is highly symptomatic from their cancer, even if we know that we can't cure them, the surgeon might offer a debulking surgery to help relieve some symptoms. Like surgery, radiation therapy is also considered a local therapy. Uh, the radiation dose that we would need to deliver in order to effectively cure or even to effectively palliate symptoms from a cancer is much too high to be delivered throughout the body systemically. And so radiation truly is considered a local therapy. And depending on the patient's stage and depending on how the patient themselves are doing, um, radiation can often be used to cure cancers. Um, but if not that, then it can also be used for aggressive local control or just palliating symptoms such as pain or bleeding. So before we can even, you know, start integrating these multidisciplinary teams, it's really important for us to have a correct diagnosis and stage for a cancer. So Usually, when a patient is diagnosed with cancer, they initially present with some chief complaint, whether it is some kind of symptom or an abnormal finding on a screening exam. Um, they'll present probably to their primary care or some kind of specialist with this chief complaint, which will prompt a full history, physical exam, maybe some imaging, and ultimately a biopsy that can lead to a tissue diagnosis of cancer. It's really important that we get a good biopsy or resection or a good tissue sample um, just so that we can identify all the histopathologic as well as the molecular features of cancer that might impact how the cancer is, um, is treated. Once we know the diagnosis, it's really important to correctly stage the patient. And what do I mean by that? 
When we say cancer staging, what we're really referring to is a way of communicating to um, the inpatient, or well, just to the patient's team, as well as to um, the patient's family, kind of how advanced is the cancer and um, what is our prognosis for the patient? How well do we think the treatment can work? So a common staging system that you may encounter is the TNM staging system, which stands for tumor, node, and metastasis. Most cancers are staged using this system, and what we're really asking is the tumor itself. How big is it? Has it invaded into nearby organs? Are there regional lymph nodes involved, and to what extent? And finally, has the cancer metastasized or spread to other organs outside of the primary organ? Once we have the TNM staging, which you can look up and it's specific to each type of cancer, we can then translate that into a more generalized group staging system. Um, and the group staging ranges from one to four, um, and it's usually a good indicator of how advanced is the cancer. Um, so generally, and again, this does not necessarily apply to all cancers, but very generally speaking, stage one and two cancers are usually early stage, Stage three is locally advanced, usually involves lymph nodes, and stage four is typically metastatic, so it has spread to other organs, and at that point it is not considered curable. It's really important that we put in the legwork and get the correct diagnosis and staging so that we can start to talk about what type of treatment we should offer. It's really, really important to have an honest discussion with all the members of the care team um, to figure out if this patient's cancer can be cured. Um, and if not, then our treatments are considered more palliative. So to help reduce symptoms and keep things at bay for as long as possible, but we know that we can't necessarily eradicate the tumor. Whether or not we can cure or palliate the cancer depends not just on the stage of the cancer, but also on the patient's condition itself. Is the patient going to be able to tolerate all kinds of therapy? And this is often a multidisciplinary consultation. It's often not a black and white situation. Um, and we have to talk with our medical and surgical oncologists to figure out what the good treatment plan should be. The patient's cancer journey um, does not end when the treatment ends. Uh, we have to continue following them for months and years to come. Um, and it's for two reasons. You know, we want to make sure that we're managing any toxicities that we may have caused from our treatment because radiation does have both short and long-term side effects. And then we also want to make sure that we're getting periodic exams and restaging imaging uh, to monitor for cancer recurrence. I mentioned something um, previously that I want to take a moment to kind of highlight. Um, it's not just the patient's cancer diagnosis and stage that determines whether or not we can cure them. It's also the status of the patient themselves. So um, here on the slide, I have a table showing what is called the ECOG performance score, um, and it ranges from zero to four, um, with zero being that a patient is fully active, able to carry out all normal functions, and four being that a patient is completely disabled um, and cannot really take care of themselves at all. Um, so if a patient is fully active, they're working full time, you know, they're up and about, we feel comfortable that they can tolerate our therapies, whether that's surgery, chemotherapy, radiation. Um, however, if a patient is already doing pretty poorly and largely bedridden, then we do fear that adding our treatments that are not without toxicity um, might kind of disable them further, and that might be life-limiting itself rather than the cancer. So it's really, really important to take into account a patient's performance status uh, when we're thinking about what type of treatment we would offer them. The ECOG performance scale is the one that I have shown here. And another one that you might encounter is what is called the Karnofsky performance score that ranges from a scale of zero to 100%. In addition to uh, performance status, there are some additional cancer terms that I just want to briefly define for you um, since you might encounter them. So we've been talking about curative treatment, and what that really means is that the intent of our therapy is to cure the patient. 
when we say that the intent is palliative, we mean that we, may, we aim to relieve symptoms, but not necessarily eradicate their tumor. When we talk about definitive therapy, um, we mean that that is kind of the treatment that will define their course. So we don't necessarily intend on additional therapies. Um, when we say neoadjuvant, we're saying that the treatment is given as a first step. So you might hear about neoadjuvant chemo or neoadjuvant radiation prior to surgery. Adjuvant then means that it's given additionally after an intervention. So you might have a patient that gets surgery and then adjuvant chemo radiation um, to kind of help um, with the local control. And finally, uh, the word concurrent. So this is most often used in the context of chemotherapy and radiation. It just means that the therapies are given at the same time as one another. So concurrent chemo radiation means we're giving chemotherapy and radiation together. Usually in this setting, the chemotherapy is given either once a week um, or every two to three weeks, um, and the patient is getting daily radiation treatments Monday through Friday. So to kind of put those terms to work um, and give you some examples, I wanted to just go through two types of cancer really quickly um, to show you how these terms are used in practice. Um, so one example is glioblastoma. Uh, which is an aggressive high-grade brain tumor formed from glial cells and it's actually the most common primary um, malignant CNS tumor that we see in adults. So glioblastoma is treated with upfront maximal safe resection. So as opposed to a biopsy when surgeons suspect a glioblastoma, um, they'll actually just take as much of it out as they possibly can. Once we have the biopsy um, results and once we have the tissue diagnosis then, um, we will treat it with concurrent chemo radiation for up to six weeks, um, followed by adjuvant chemotherapy alone um, for six to 12 months. And so because GBM is such an aggressive tumor, it's an example where we want to use all the tools in our toolbox. So surgery, followed by chemo radiation, followed by even more chemotherapy um, to try and keep it at bay for as long as possible. The next example is stage 3 non-small cell lung cancer. So stage 3 um, refers to the fact that the tumor has spread to the mediastinal lymph nodes. So it's kind of lymph nodes in the center of the chest. So we can't safely resect these because that would involve removing the entire lung and it wouldn't even be possible because they're in the central airway at this point. We can't really cut off the central airway. Um, and so the treatment paradigm for stage three non-small cell lung cancer involves concurrent chemotherapy and radiation followed by adjuvant immunotherapy. So that means that we're adding an additional therapy after our um, primary concurrent chemo radiation. Hopefully at this point you have a general sense as to um, how we approach cancer and how we think about treatments for cancer. Uh, what I'd like to do now is talk a little bit about radiation itself and some details about how radiation is delivered. Radiation therapy is delivered in units called gray, and one gray is a joule per kilogram, but you don't have to worry about memorizing that right now. Just understand that, you know, the dose is given in units called gray. And radiation treatments are divided into fractions. And conventionally, we have always delivered radiation therapy Monday through Friday over the course of several weeks. So we have a total dose of radiation that we want to give, and we divide it into multiple fractions. The reason for this is that uh, we, we learned um, in, you know, since kind of radiation was started to be used, that if we gave all the dose that we wanted in a short period of time, um, or in just a few fractions, it caused a lot of side effects. However, splitting the radiation up into multiple daily fractions over the course of weeks allowed time for the normal cells in our body to heal and gradually build up to the dose of radiation that can kill cancer. So just like chemotherapy is given in cycles, um, either once a week or every month um, or every few weeks, Radiation is divided into fractions given every day, Monday through Friday. Now, this concept of fractionating radiation and giving it over multiple weeks really started out um, in an era when the radiation machines were not very technologically advanced. 
In the modern era, uh, we are able to more precisely deliver radiation to the targets that we want to treat um, while sparing all the critical structures that are in the vicinity. And so in the modern era, we have kind of evolved towards hypofractionating radiation treatments. So as opposed to giving breast cancer treatments, for example, over a course of five to six weeks, we can give a little bit more dose of radiation every day and get done with treatment in as few as three to four weeks. Um, so this is called moderate hypofractionation. And finally, as the technology has advanced even more and our treatment has become even more targeted, uh, we have moved towards ultra fractionation in some cases where we can deliver high doses of radiation per fraction in just one to five fractions. And the term for this is stereotactic radiation. So you might hear the words stereotactic radiosurgery or stereotactic body radiation therapy. And that really refers to that ultra hypofractionated treatment where we're giving a high dose of radiation in just one to five fractions. Radiation therapy uh, can be delivered uh, using a few different modalities. So one way that it can be delivered is externally, using external beam radiation therapy, where a radiation beam is shined from the outside of the patient's body um, towards a target. And usually the radiation comes from multiple angles and in the area where it overlaps, it's the target of the radiation, um, and so that's where the highest dose of radiation is delivered. However, all the surrounding structures do get some low dose of radiation. Uh, there's a few different modalities for external beam radiation. The most common one that we use um, in radiation departments, it's what's called photon therapy, and photons are the same as essentially x-rays, so it's an x-ray therapy that's delivered. Um, some other particles that we might use are electrons. Um, electrons have a very low mass, and so they're very effective at treating superficial tumors. Um, protons are heavier, um, and they, they don't have as much of an exit dose. So whenever photons are shined on a patient's body, you know they enter the body and they continue to treat the patient all the way through the body. Um, protons tend to have kind of a stopping point, and so they're better um, at, you know, sparing some normal organs in some cases, and oftentimes proton therapy is preferred in pediatric patients. So those are just some examples of um, techniques that we might use for external beam radiation. Um, another modality that we use is what is called brachytherapy, and brachytherapy really refers to using some type of radioactive source. Um, it's a radioactive seed, and that seed is inserted um, into the patient's body, and it's held very close to the tissue that we actually want to treat. Um, and depending on the activity level of that radioactive source, um, the radiation can be either given at a low dose rate, or if the source has a higher activity, it can be given at a high dose rate. Um, and so we will go through some examples and show you some pictures to talk about what we mean by that. Let's start by talking about external beam radiation. So external beam radiation is delivered using a machine called a linear accelerator, which is abbreviated LINAC. A linear accelerator accelerates electrons to a tungsten target, and that results in the production of photons in what is known as the head of the gantry. Um, the head of the gantry is then angled around the patient in various ways, um, and these photon treatments are delivered. And like I said, the, the photons, which are also known as x-rays, uh, kind of come into the patient's body from different angles, um, delivering low doses of radiation throughout the body, but the area where they all overlap is usually the target area. And so the machine that we're using for most of our radiation treatments is known as a LINAC. When we talk about conventional radiation, uh, we're referring to um, kind of 2D radiation plans. So it used to be that our radiation machines were not very sophisticated. So we would just kind of draw a box, like as if you're getting an x-ray scan, um, and we would kind of draw a box around the area that we wanted to treat and shine our x-ray beam. So the x-rays would come from very simple angles, either an anterior angle and a posterior angle, um, two lateral x-rays, um, or maybe you know some oblique angles as shown in that third picture. Um, and they would result in a dose distribution that was very large. So you can see you know, in, in all of these cases, our target is to treat the vertebral body, 
but the color wash that we see is showing a lot of dose going to surrounding organs as well. So there's a lot of dose going kind of um, in that first picture to the abdominal organs that are ahead of the vertebral bodies. Um, and same thing in that second picture, we see the head and neck region, and there's a lot of dose spreading out laterally. So the 2D radiation plans had a very simple setup, and we still use these sometimes in the modern era in palliative cases. Um, but when we want to give higher doses of radiation, the 2D methods are really not ideal. Over time, we were able to develop uh, kind of a step up from 2D radiation, something called 3D radiation. And so 3D radiation plans um, became more complex. We were able to deliver more fields, um, and we were actually able to contour target organs, uh, so kind of in a 3D format, going slice by slice through a CT scan. And we were able to also contour out certain organs at risk. Um, and so that allows us to kind of calculate how much dose is actually going to the target organ and how much dose is going to different organs at risk. Um, and 3D plans can use some more um, techniques such as wedges and things like that to kind of help better shape the dose um, relative to the patient's body contour um, and to kind of help increase the amount of therapeutic dose going to the target organ and decrease the amount of low dose um, spreading out to all the surrounding critical structures. A huge improvement um, from the radiation perspective uh, was kind of the development of these multi-leaf collimators. Um, multi-leaf collimators are these leaf-like structures made out of lead um, that are in the head of the gantry. And so when the x-ray beam is shined, um, you know, in the, in the form of, let's say, a square, um, these multi-leaf collimators can actually be arranged in front of that beam and they can kind of help better shape the dose. So rather than projecting a full square of radiation everywhere, these multi-leaf collimators are very useful at blocking the radiation in certain areas and allowing um, more customized shapes to be created that just allow the radiation to be delivered in the area that we want it to. Because of the presence of these multi-leaf collimators, uh, we were actually able to further advance um, how we give the radiation and deliver something called intensity modulated radiation therapy, or IMRT. So as opposed to 3D radiation where you you know, really just have a square of radiation shining on the patient and maybe some kind of minimal ways of, of modulating the radiation. Um, with intensity modulated radiation therapy, um, we're actually also changing the intensity of the radiation beam itself and using these MLC leaves um, to kind of better shape the radiation um, to our target volume. Um, and this just allows for a more conformal dose distribution. Um, one way of doing it is to do what is called segmental IMRT, where the beam positions itself at the correct angle, the MLC leaves, you know, come into place, and then the radiation is given all at once um, in, in what is called a step and shoot approach. So each time the machine has to move, the MLCs have to move, and then the beam turns on and delivers some radiation. There's something else known as dynamic intensity modulated radiation, where the MLC leaves can actually continuously move while the radiation is being delivered. Um, so imagine the beam is on, the radiation is coming out of the head, but the MLC leaves are in the way, kind of continuously moving in and out of the picture. Um, as you can see in the picture here on this slide, uh, IMRT helps us to create much more conformal dose distributions, and we do get low dose spread um, to a lot of surrounding structures, but that red area of the color wash, which represents kind of our, our therapeutic radiation dose, um, it's really conformal to the drawn um, target organ that we want to treat. The volumetric uh, modulated arc radiation therapy, or VMAT, is a type of IMRT radiation where now the machine, the head of the machine is moving in kind of a continuous arc around the patient. And while it's moving, it's delivering radiation the whole times, and those MLC leaves are dynamically moving in and out of the picture the whole time. 
to really conformally shape the radiation dose and help to create a dose distribution that's highly, highly conformal to the target area. Nowadays, we largely use VMAT to treat things in the pelvis. We use VMAT to treat head and neck cancers, um, and it has really kind of transformed how we're delivering radiation. The last uh, abbreviation that I want to touch on when it comes to external beam radiation is the SRS or SBRT. Both of these refer to stereotactic radiation. SRS typically refers to brain tumors and SBRT refers to things in other parts of the body. But this, as I mentioned before, is the highly targeted technique where we're treating um, you know, higher doses of radiation per fraction and we're using anywhere from one to five fractions. The way that we deliver SRS and SBRT, um, you know, when we use a LINAC, um, we're using IMRT or VMAT planning techniques, um, but what we're trying to do is push a lot of the target dose into the targeted organ and create really sharp dose fall-offs so that there is not, none of that low dose spread around the target organ. We're really just trying to treat the dose highly conformally to the target volume um, and spare all the critical structures that are nearby. Um, and this is used to give kind of ablative doses in one to five fractions uh, to brain tumors, small enough lung tumors, and things in the spine and the abdomen that are safe to treat with the stereotactic treatments. Let's go ahead and wrap up our discussion on radiation therapy modalities um, with two examples of brachytherapy. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, brachytherapy is internal radiation treatment where a radioactive source is placed um, in the tissue that we want to treat. So an example of low dose rate brachytherapy is prostate seed implants. Um, so sometimes for prostate cancer, um, patients will undergo prostate seed implants where um, a radioactive seed with a relatively low activity is permanently implanted into the prostate. This is usually done in the operating room. Um, a template is placed over the patient's perineum and we use a rectal ultrasound to help visualize where these seeds are being placed. The seeds are radioactive. They're permanently implanted into the patient. Um, and, you know, given depending on the half-life of the seed, they are radioactive only for a period of two months or so. Um, and after that point, um, the radioactivity kind of dies off. It's no longer detectable. So the patient has the seeds in their prostate forever, um, but just in those first couple of months is when they're actually radioactive and effectively treating the patient's cancer. They're giving off radiation at low doses, hence the name low dose rate brachytherapy. In contrast to low dose rate brachytherapy, we also have something called high dose rate or HDR brachytherapy. Um, in this type of brachytherapy, um, the radioactive seed that we use actually has a much higher dose rate, um, and so it wouldn't be safe to permanently implant that into a patient. You know, that could actually kill them. Um, but the seed is instead implanted for a short period of time, and then it's actually removed, um, and the patient might come in for a few fractions of this type of treatment, usually anywhere from two to five fractions. So what happens with high dose rate brachytherapy, um, one example that we would use this is gynecologic cancer, such as cervical cancer. So in this case, some type of applicator is actually placed into the area of interest. Um, in the picture here, we see a device called a tandem and ring um, placed into the patient's cervix. Um, and then that applicator is connected with a wire to a machine called an afterloader that actually contains that high dose rate brachytherapy source. The seed is then transported from that machine through that wire into the applicator and the seed dwells within the applicator for a period of time, usually five to 10 minutes. Um, and then the seed, you know, is transported back into the afterloader. We remove the applicator from the patient, we make sure there's no residual radioactivity, the patient goes home, and then they may come back um, for a couple more fractions of this type of treatment. The big advantage of brachytherapy is that 
the treatment is local. So we're holding the radioactive source very close to the organ that we want to treat. Um, and it's actually better at sparing certain normal critical structures that are in that vicinity. So in gynecologic cancer specifically, we're often limited in terms of how much dose we can give to the pelvis just because the bowel um, and the rectum are so sensitive to radiation. So giving this additional brachytherapy boost after some um, external radiation has already been delivered allows us to build up to a higher dose and effectively kill uh, these cancers. Very quickly then, let's wrap up by talking about when radiation might be used. In a lot of cases, radiation can actually be used to cure cancer. Assuming that the patient's stage is such that cure is an option, um, and also that the patient is good enough performance status to tolerate um, this type of therapy, um, you know, definitive radiation or a combination of chemotherapy and radiation can be used to cure cancers in the head and neck region, lung cancer, prostate cancer, anal cancer, cervical cancer, um, among others. We can also often utilize radiation in the adjuvant setting or radiation with concurrent chemotherapy um, to try to cure um, other cancers, including glioma, um, breast cancer, pancreas cancer, and sarcoma, just to name a few. If a patient has metastatic cancer or some kind of incurable disease, radiation can still be very effective at palliation. So we can, you know, deliver some dose of radiation to try and help improve symptoms such as pain, bleeding, if there's any kind of obstruction, spinal cord compression, um, radiation can be very effective at helping with these symptoms. Um, typically, when we're giving palliative radiation, uh, we try to limit the number of treatments just because these patients are often very sick. Um, and so we can deliver effective palliative doses anywhere from 1 to 10 fractions. Finally, uh, radiation has a unique use in what is called oligometastatic disease. So there has been a lot of literature and some clinical trials now demonstrating that there is a subset of patients who have metastatic cancer um, that kind of represents an in-between between having kind of a localized curable cancer and a cancer that's very widespread and widely metastatic. This is called oligometastatic cancer. Oligo means few, so they just have a few sites of metastatic disease. And the, the cancer biology in this case is thought to be a little bit different. And so in oligometastatic conditions, um, sometimes we can just give consolidative radiation um, using either external beam radiation or stereotactic radiation to try and locally control, kind of aggressive local control of these oligometastatic disease sites um, and try and get the patient either into remission um, or just keep the cancer at bay for as long as possible. So there is kind of an in-between between a curative radiation dose and a palliative radiation dose um, that can be used for oligometastatic disease. I did mention that radiation can be used to treat several benign conditions, um, and some examples of these include meningioma, which can range from benign to malignant, acoustic neuroma, trigeminal neuralgia, thalamic ablation to treat tremors, um, keloids, Deputrian's contracture, um, and we can also give radiation um, to prevent the formation of heterotopic ossification. So these are just some examples when radiation um, can be used to treat. Other examples include osteoarthritis um, or to help clear um, cardiac narrowing that's kind of refractory to drug-eluting stents. Um, so these are just some examples of radiation for benign conditions. And that is all I have for now. Um, hopefully this introductory lecture to clinical radiation oncology was useful for you um, and gave you kind of an overview of the field and what kind of things we do. If you're interested in learning about how radiation actually works and how it makes cancer cells die, um, I would encourage you to check out the accompanying introductory lectures talking about radiation biology and the basics of radiation physics. Um, thank you so much for your time.